Hello there, my beloved Batties. What's the deal with these things? I mean, we all know this moment. But apples in storytelling are more than the sum of their parts. They crop up all the time in fairy tales, mythology, and folklore. They're one of the most cultivated fruits on the planet, which is probably a good enough reason as to why they appear everywhere, but I wanted to take a deeper dive into their symbolism and all the different places they appear and why, similar to what I did with the history of the Enchanted Forest. I think this might be a good time to mention that I actually really don't like apples. <laughs> I like apple juice, apple pie, but apples just by themselves, I've never really liked them. That's partially due to having chronic TNJ disorder, which means I'm physically incapable of biting into an apple, but I digress. <laughs> I personally like to think of apples in storytelling as falling into two very loosely defined camps, golden and poison. I want to stress that these terms in this context are not in the folkloric literature, and it's just a way that I personally like to look at them. Such descriptions of the apples in stories can be taken literally in some cases, as we'll see, but they can also represent the symbolism itself as anything from the sacred and elevated to the tempting and dangerous. I'm not distinguishing between them here, but I think it's an interesting notion to be aware of going forward in seeing how wide-ranging apples are in the way that they're presented in stories. I'll cover them in the best kind of historical timeline I can, but before I dive in, it's important to have a little background. Crab apple trees originated in Central Asia and are thought to have been domesticated between 4,000 and 10,000 years ago before moving along the Silk Road to Europe. They went on to be cultivated all over the world and bred into many different varieties. The word apple itself comes from Old English, itself from a proto-Germanic root which can mean fruit in general, but this actually gives us a problem with identifying apples in various types of story. Nowadays, the word apple is synonymous with this thing, but that wasn't always so. As late as the 17th century, the word apple could mean literally anything from an apple to a potato. Basically, every foreign fruit which wasn't a berry was fair game, including nuts and even bananas. Here's a couple of archaic examples. Tomatoes, love apples. Oranges, golden apples. Cucumbers and potatoes, earth apples. So with that being established, let's get stuck in with the history of apples. We're going to begin this little journey in Greek mythology, which features three instances of actual golden apples. The first instance concerns a woman named Atalanta, who heard a prophecy that went something along the lines of, If you get married, it will be your downfall. So she instead became a huntress, and she was pretty good at it. Her speed in particular was renowned. She did eventually agree to marry, but anyone who wanted to win her hand also had to beat her in a foot race, or she would have them put to death. After many victories, and deaths, a guy named Melanion came along and was given three golden apples by the goddess Aphrodite, who told him to drop them one at a time to distract Atalanta for long enough for him to get ahead of her. Sure enough, it worked, and he won the race and her hand in marriage. And side note, Melanion could derive from melon, the Greek word for apples and fruit in general. Aphrodite was associated with apples because they were the fruit of love in ancient Greece. To throw an apple at someone was a way of declaring one's love, and if you caught an apple thrown at you, it was shown as a way of reciprocating that love, and I assume of avoiding concussion. This idea of throwing apples links quite nicely to the second Greek story to mention them. Zeus was throwing a party, but in a very Sleeping Beauty-esque move, he deliberately didn't invite Eris, the goddess of discord, because he expected her to cause trouble and genuinely just ruin the day. So she turned up uninvited and threw a golden apple into the ceremony, inscribed with the words, For the Most Beautiful. This is the origin of the phrase Apple of Discord because it caused a beauty contest between Hera, Aphrodite and Athena, who all asked Zeus to tell them who was most deserving of the apple. But Zeus was like, oh, hey, uh, I really don't want to get involved in this. Go ask Paris of Troy, he's a fair guy. All three of the goddesses went to Paris and stripped off in front of him and each offered him bribes in return for the apple. He eventually accepted Aphrodite's offer of the love of the most beautiful woman in the world, who happened to be Helen of Sparta. 
However, this ended up causing the Trojan War and led to the destruction of both Paris and the city of Troy, so yeah, apple of discord. And speaking of Hera, she provides us with the third instance of the Greek golden apples, which somewhat ironically is where Eris snatched the apple of discord in the previous story. Hera had an orchard called the Garden of the Hesperides in which the tree of life grew laden with golden apples. The Hesperides were the nymphs of the evenings and the light of sunsets, and they tend to be taken as the daughters of Atlas, the titan condemned to hold up the sky. They were responsible for tending to the orchard, but they liked to help themselves to the apples on occasion, so Hera decided to throw in there a dragon who never slept, was immortal, and had a hundred heads. Seems a bit like overkill, but she really liked those apples. However, Heracles, maybe more well known as Hercules, travelled to the garden as part of his twelve labours to pick the apples, but he asked Atlas to help him by offering to hold up the sky in his place while he went to the tree and snuck around that pesky dragon. Afterwards, quite liking the idea that he didn't need to take back the heavens if he didn't want to, Atlas decided to deliver the apples himself, but Heracles tricked him by asking him to hold up the sky for just long enough for him to fix his cloak. Of course, as soon as he was free, Hercules was like, Haha, so long, sucker! Now we're going to leave Greece and head to the Bible. We all know the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, but the forbidden fruit mentioned in the book of Genesis is never strictly identified. It's generally taken to be an apple in popular Christian tradition, but it could also have been a grape, a pomegranate, a fig, a citron, or even mushrooms. The idea of pomegranate in particular is interesting because it might show parallels to Greek mythology, where Hades tricks Persephone into eating pomegranate, which is the food of the underworld. The confusion about what fruit hung on the Tree of Eden might come from a mistranslation of the Latin word malum, which can mean an apple or an evil. Indeed, the fruit grows on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and good and evil in Latin is bonum et malum. The idea of the fruit being an apple, however, persists in popular images. Renaissance painters often depicted it as an apple, and it might have been inspired by the golden apples in Greek mythology. The human larynx has also been called the Adam's apple due to the belief that the fruit lodged in Adam's throat. As a result, the apple became synonymous with knowledge, immortality, sin, temptation, and the fall of man. But in a somewhat parallel and possibly ironic vein, apples have been suggested to imply human sexuality and seduction, as well as the knowledge of good and evil. After eating the forbidden fruit, Adam and Eve become aware that they are naked and try to conceal their bodies beneath clothes made from fig leaves. Again, another potential connection to the idea that the apple may be indeed a fig. But apples aren't limited to negative connotations in Christian imagery, and the evolution of its symbolism happens most clearly between the Old and New Testaments. When Christ is shown holding an apple, he represents the second Adam who brings life, and the fruit becomes a redemption from the earlier fall. Now it's time to head into Norse mythology. The most important figure linked with apples here is the goddess Ithun, who provided apples of eternal youth to the gods. Her name itself can varyingly mean the rejuvenating one or the ever young. She was lured into a forest by Loki, who told her, Hey, I found some really awesome apples which you might want to keep. You should bring a couple of your own so you can compare them. This was actually a vow that he had made with a shape-shifting giant named Thiazzi, who had attacked Loki and ceased only on the condition that he convinced Ethan to come out of Asgard with her apples. Sure enough, he snatched Ethan in eagle shape and carried her off, and without her apples, the gods began to age. They figured out Loki had something to do with it, which was pretty much par for the course, and eventually forced him to get her back under pain of death and torture. The idea of Ithun's apples being able to maintain youth may be linked to religious practices in German paganism as a whole, as demonstrated by scholar Hilda Ellis Davidson. She attests that the fruits are connected to the Vanir, a group of gods in Norse mythology which are associated with fertility. Eleven golden apples were used to woo Gerthra, and when King Rere wished for a child, the Vanir Frigg sent a messenger crow to drop an apple into his lap. When his wife ate the apple, his wife became pregnant with the hero Volsung, a pregnancy which lasted six years. Poor woman. <laughs> Time to head south now to Ireland and Celtic mythology. 
Apples aren't strictly as specific or even as major in Irish folklore as they are in the Greek and Norse, but it's worth mentioning anyway. They form an element of the silver branch which was connected to entering the other world, but there's a bit of a discrepancy here about whether they were even apples at all. They've alternatively been called balls of red gold or even musical balls. In various texts, the branch has been referred to as a fairy branch, with the ability to take away woes and create uplifting music which eased the pain of ill and pained people and put them to sleep. Oh dear, I'm in so much pain. Ooh, that music sounds beautiful. The branch itself was said to come from Amhain Ablak, a realm belonging to the sea god and otherworld king Mananan Maclear. Celtic mythology, however, takes us into British mythology, which in turn leads us to King Arthur. And if there's anywhere as synonymous as Camelot with King Arthur, that place is Avalon. Avalon literally means the Island of the Fruit Trees, or the Isle of the Apples, and its name was first recorded by Geoffrey of Monmouth in the 12th century as being Insula Pomerum, from the Latin word for fruit tree. The later name of Avalon may be of Welsh origin, but although it could also be derived from the Old Welsh, Old Cornish or Old Breton languages. It may also be related to the earlier Irish legends of Manan and Maclear. Avalon itself is the place where Excalibur is forged and is also where Arthur himself is taken after he's wounded after the Battle of Camla. It's called as such because it's said to be a place which produces all things of itself. As the medieval Spanish scholar Isidore of Seville describes, the fields there have no needs of the ploughs of the farmers and all cultivation is lacking except what nature provides. Of its own accord it produces grain and grapes and apple trees grow in its woods from close to clipped grass. It was later said by Thomas Mallory to be home to women who knew all the magic in the world, and while Arthur's face is sometimes left uncertain in the legends, several variants attest that he has been rejuvenated by the island and awaits for the day to return and defend Britain from its enemies, once again connecting the apples to properties of youth and fertility. All of these threads, beginning in mythology, then moving into legend, now brings us back to where we started fairy tales. Golden apples appear in several fairy tales, especially those from Germanic and Eastern Europe. These include Zarevic Ivan the Firebird and the Grey Wolf from Russia, the Golden Bird, the Golden Mermaid and the White Snake from Germany, Presla the Brave and the Golden Apples from Romania, and the Nine Pea Hens and the Golden Apples from Serbia and Bulgaria. All of these begin with a king who has a tree which bears golden apples, but they keep getting stolen, usually by a bird. In this way, they are objects of rarity, themselves not inherently magical, but symbolize more than the sum of their parts. The most famous apple in fairy tales, however, is not golden at all. Snow White's poisoned apple in the original fairy tale is actually only half poisoned. Half is red, the other is white. By this point, the evil queen had already tried to kill Snow White twice, so understandably, she's a little hesitant to accept the apple. So the queen cut it in half down the middle and ate the white harmless part to prove it was safe, which led to Snow White eating the red poisoned half and leading to... this. In a potential connection to the forbidden fruit remaining in Adam's throat in the Bible, Snow White is actually awoken not by true love's kiss, but when her glass coffin is accidentally dropped and the piece she swallowed dislodges. It's been suggested to have a number of links to different Christian symbolism, but I'd also argue that it can represent many of the themes we've discussed from all over the world. We have temptation and sin on the part of the queen, the threat of Snow White's youth and fertility, and the apple itself even possibly becomes the apple of discord. Because let's face it, the queen can kinda be seen as dragging Snow White into a beauty contest like what happened with the Greek goddesses. At basic level, both eat from the apple, but only one emerges victorious. And that, ends our sneak peek into the history and symbolism of these unassuming fruits, both golden and poison. I really hope you found this video interesting, please give it a big thumbs up if you did, and please don't forget to leave me a comment and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, it would be great to have you as part of our little batty family. Thank you very much for watching, have a nice day, stay safe, and I'll see you all again very soon in another video. Bye! 
musical balls. Give me musical balls. Oh dear. <laughs> and that. <laughs> I should join the circus. <laughs> and that. I think that apple's bruised.